From a network of highly secured, top secret locations across North America, this is the post deadline version of the Spurs Insider Podcast. I'm Mike Finger with Express News Sports Editor Nick Talbot, beat writer Tom Orsborne, and from Atlanta with the completely, maybe not completely, but significantly remade San Antonio Spurs, beat writer Jeff McDonald. We are recording this a mere matter of hours after the Spurs um, did some unprecedented wheeling and dealing at the deadline. Jeff, just uh, put into perspective what happened on a busy Thursday. First of all, I think this is what uh, uh, they in the business call an emergency pod. We had to have a, we had to convene for an emergency podcast. I see. That's what I think they call it in the biz. I'm not sure. I still don't know what the, what, what the biz is about, but putting in perspective uh, for, for a while, this trade deadline, it was a lot of just collecting draft picks and like the first big move the Spurs made today was trading Thad Young, which we all saw coming. But once you start dumping Derek White to the Celtics for draft pick, I think you're signaling loud and clear that you are in the uh, just tear down phase of uh, this rebuilding project. They're not going to tread water. They're not interested in treading water and uh, anymore and, and, and letting this, the whole of that group go together. I think it's about, First and foremost, how many first round picks can we um, pocket? And secondly, how many second round picks can we pocket? Just draft capital, draft capital, draft capital. And once you've made that decision, um, you know, the Spurs made some pretty good moves today. If that's if that's the goal they had in mind with, the, you know, they're going to have three picks next summer in the first round, it appears. Um, so, you know, good job to Brian Wright and those those guys that might not look great on the record for the rest of the year. Um, but you know, it, this, this is, a, this, these are moves that the Spurs obviously are hoping will pay off down the road, not immediately. And as uh, pointed out, Jeff, you know, also, you know, it's a deep draft, you know, they have the, the cap flexibility, you know, to help them out in free agency. So it's uh, it was a good day. Uh, I hate to see Derek go, but it was a, it was a good day. If you look at it just from that pure rebuilding aspect and gaining fuel to keep it going because the spurs tend to operate in just about utter radio silence most of the time you are unsure heading into the trade deadline day into thursday whether they would do anything at all i think there was a lot of noise out there i think there was it was it was quite clear to all of us um you know we'd all heard that they were having conversations and that players were available but there was a possibility going into the day it seemed like that maybe nothing got done because historically the Spurs don't do things at the trade deadline. And I had mentioned to Jeff earlier today that I was fully prepared to say if they got through this whole day without, for instance, dealing Thad Young, which I think we all thought was likely all along, but he hadn't been dealt as of a few hours ago. Um, if they hadn't dealt Thad Young, if they hadn't done anything, I was prepared to say they'd made a mistake. And I was sort of formulating that, like how big of a mistake would it have been for them just to stand pat at this moment? And so even though um, what they did was, the, I, I think, first of all, what they did was the right thing to do. But I don't think it was necessarily automatic considering the way this franchise always has um, kind of stuck with the idea that you're trying to to put a competitive team out there. You're never really starting over. They have not done that the past few years. This was a significant moment for them in terms of not sticking with what they've always done. They're, they're not going to try to make a, a play in game this year. I mean, the, the guys who are left are going to compete, but this was a concession that they are heading in a new direction. And uh, I mean, that to, to, to give up a player like Tom mentioned, like Derek White, one of those guys who just everybody in the franchise loves for so many reasons, a guy who you picked at the bottom of the first round of the draft who became a significant player for you, a significant member of the locker room, a significant member of the community, to kind of like brush away that sentimentality and that allegiance to that guy and say, yeah, you've been great, Derek, but you know, a first round pick suits us more now. 
That's significant. And it's like, I almost think we should acknowledge it's worth giving the Spurs credit for kind of being cold and calculating <laughs> in a way, um, because I, I think that was the hard thing to do for somebody like Greg Popovich for somebody like Brian Wright for all, up and down the organization to, to walk away from a player like that. Uh, but I think it's for the, for the good of the future. In hindsight, you know, Pop last night, I asked him about this, this, this uh, period and what it's like, you know, how tough it is. And, you know, he was very open about saying it's, it's just like training camp. You know, you hate to tell a guy in training camp, you need to do something else for a living, go find your happiness elsewhere. <laughs> but, yeah. uh, you know, uh, he had to make some tough conversations today and looking back at it, he probably knew last night, you know, what they were, what they were formulating. And of course he did. Right. I mean, of course he did. And and so it was just a little foreshadowing on his part that today was going to be a tough day for the franchise in terms of saying goodbye to Derek White. Andrew Eubanks also, they right. pop was fond of him and they, they put some time and work into making him a better player. Yeah. I'll go a step further and say they probably wish they could have moved, moved Jakob Pertl for a first round pick as well. I definitely think that that was uh, that was that was uh, uh, something they were working on. Um, and and I I don't think I think to clarify there they weren't going to move him for any first round pick. I think that there were deals where uh, you combine a first round pick and and another useful piece. And maybe those didn't come to fruition, but. Like Jeff said, once at the top of the uh, at the top of the show, once you decided to move on from Derek White, you're moving into a new era, and uh, you're you know I don't I don't think anybody is really off limits at that point, and I think probably other players who are still with the Spurs at this moment, um, they were probably up for discussion. One of the things that makes it. Um makes Derek White a, a good person to trade. I mean, just in the cold business sense at this time is we think of him as part of the young core, but he's really the oldest part of that young core. He's 27. Um, he's right. got a contract that was going to take him to age 30. Um, you know, of, of all the people, if you're, if you're really going young and you're really trying to build a foundation, he's probably the guy you could give up first. That doesn't mean he wasn't a super important part of the team this year and, and going forward. But I think if you're looking, if you're looking long-term, um, he was going to probably run out of gas before some of these other guys that they have coming up. And I think in the, in the games to come, you're going to see a lot of, um, you know, more Devin Vassell. You're going to see a lot of Josh Primo probably, or at least more than we've seen. I wouldn't be shocked if, I don't know. I'm just guessing. I'm just talking out my, you know what, but I wouldn't be shocked if Primo doesn't spend much more time in the G league. Now that the Spurs are in this situation. Um, so it kind of, it also kind of clears the decks to sort of develop some guys and, and, um, you know, they don't they don't care about winning games so much. It's really takes me back to when the Spurs went to that bubble in Orlando during that middle that um interrupted season in 2020, where Pop used it as a reset to just, you know, we basically said going to the bubble, we're not competing for the playoffs. If it works, it works. But we really just want to look at our young guys. And I think the Spurs are about to enter that sort of kind of um, vibe now. You know, you're right about Derek White. Age wise, also salary wise, it, it sounds cold again, um, but you can go from an absolute steal at 29 and be an under the radar, you know, one of the one of the most underrated players in the league to being overpaid pretty quickly. And I think Derek was in danger of kind of being in that range, not that he didn't have value to the Spurs, not that they weren't better with him on the floor than they were with him off the floor, which was absolutely was true. We've seen that this year when Derek hasn't been around. When DeJounte hasn't been around, when Yaka Pertle hasn't been around, they haven't been as good. But um, as a franchise, you ask yourself, is he worth $72 million over four years? And if he's not, can you find a better use for that salary cap room? And I think the, the Spurs came to a pretty obvious conclusion uh, in that regard. And for, for those who talk about how, you know, like, Pop mentioned to to Tom last night about you know the, the tough part of saying goodbye to somebody and and equating it to training camp and telling somebody's got to do something else. And there are people who say, well, he's going to a to a better team and he's going to a playoff race, so of course he's going to be happy. Well, these are 
these are human beings. <laughs> and, and Derek is not just looking at it, I'm sure, as, oh, I'm going to a better MBA situation. Uh, he's looking at it. He spent however many years in San Antonio, really entrenching himself as part of, you know, a group of people, a group of uh, co-workers, a, a community. And it's, it's, it's got to be tough. How many damn charges did that guy take for the Spurs? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, yeah, and, and Drew Eubanks the same way. They, they had to include Drew Eubanks in the Thad Young trade um, to make the salaries work and to get that first round pick from Toronto. Those, those are tough situations. I think Drew's already been waived by Toronto. So, I mean, that's, that's a kick in the, you know what, uh, you wake up in the morning, you got a job, and then by the end of the day, you're out of a job. Completely. Yeah, but he still gets his money, though. Yeah, he still gets yeah. his money, and he'll land somewhere. But you know, that's a tough, tough deal. Who do you think was the happiest um, person today with the Spurs moves? Huh. I think it was Thaddeus Young. Oh, of course, no, of course. No, no, no. From, from that perspective, yeah. Yes, yes. I mean, I mean, I'm assuming Toronto will play him. Maybe they won't. I don't know. But he, he got out of a place where um, he wasn't going to play. And he gets to go be a part of a team that's kind of maybe not going to win a championship, but is competing for playoffs and and stuff. And I, you've got to assume he'll play more for the Raptors than he was for the Spurs. If they didn't plan on playing, they wouldn't give up the first round pick. Right. Good point. Dad Young, as the listeners of the podcast are fully aware. He's a consummate professional. He's, consummate he's a pro. Professional. It's the first thing you got to say about Dad Young is he's a pro. Second thing you say about him is he was a key piece of the DeMar DeRozan trade last summer that brought a, a first round pick that will probably be conveyed in 2025. Maybe it, it, it might get pushed back farther than that, but that, that was basically a deal DeMar DeRozan to Chicago for that first rounder and Thad Young. And I believe a second, Yeah, but that, that and uh, the, uh, Aminu was part of that too, I guess. Uh, how how quickly we forget, but um, but anyway, that that was not an insignificant part of that. And for the past few months, we've been saying, well, they got their first rounder. Did they really need to convert him? Like he was, he had value, and so he gets another first rounder out of that deal. Demar ends up netting two first round picks and a second. And if you take it back even further than that, we can go way back to the early days of the Spurs Insider podcast, back when uh, a, a young man named Kawhi Leonard was a San Antonio Spur and uh, made a polite request to no longer be a San Antonio Spur, <laughs> which kind of put the, uh, the local cagers front office over a barrel in terms of having to trade a guy for pennies, nickels dimes on the dollar, whatever it might've been. And at the time, again, we've, we've covered this ad nauseum, but four years ago, you're thinking, did, how well did the Spurs really do? Here is, here is the net haul at the moment for the Kawhi Leonard, Danny Green trade to, to Toronto. Uh, you have one Jakob Pertl, one Keldon Johnson, who was selected with a pick that the Raptors sent that year. And then you have two first-round picks, one from Chicago in 2025, one from Toronto in 2022. Pro probably. Probably. Uh, the, these are protected, but the, they, they are sort of lightly protected. They're probably going to convey. If Toronto if Toronto's just marginally good, they're, gonna, they're yeah. going to convey in the next two years. So, so yeah, you have yeah, – basically, if you consider – And a second-rounder, And a second-rounder. Yeah, second the – if you consider Jakob Pertl and Keldon Johnson first round picks, which they were, that is four first round picks and a second rounder for Kawhi Leonard and Danny Green. And none of those are guaranteed to be superstars and none of them probably will end up being the caliber of player that Kawhi Leonard was, but that's pretty good. Yeah. Like it's not, a, it's, it's by no means a disaster. It, it's just funny how these things kind of uh, resolve themselves over the years. And I was noticing Kawhi Leonard hadn't scored a point all year. That's true. <laughs> The Spurs did well there. They really, if you look at it, cold and calculating wise, they did. I think they probably want. I mean, you, you're going to miss Derek White, but they probably won every trade today, or at least broke even in terms of value outside of not knowing what those picks will, you know, end up to being. They could be Luka Samanich, but you could get another Keldon Johnson at 18 or 20, or 
don't know what those are going to be, but looking at it cold and calculating for value, they probably won or broke even on all the trades today. They, they did well for themselves. I think that's true from their perspective. I think that um, declaring a winner in every trade, um, I'm not always a big fan of that because like if the, if the Celtics, the Celtics and, and Spurs could both get what they want out of this. If, if Derek fits in with Tatum and Brown and makes them better, like they, like the Celtics can decide a first rounder was worth that. And the Spurs can decide that first rounder suits them better than Derek did. I, I think there can be two winner trades. Yeah, ab- 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 absolutely. But from the Spurs point of view, I think they did very, they did very yeah, well for I, what they want to do. I, I, they accomplished sure. their goals. I think they accomplished their goals. And I think if you, we want to go back a, a few days, they did that. This seems like ancient history now, but earlier this week, there was the Juancho Hernan Gomez was thrown into a deal that turned into another second round pick. Yeah, that was um, just yesterday. Was it yesterday? It was just well, yesterday. Just, for the, for, like for the listeners, who knows when the listeners are listening? I mean, I don't know how the, the I don't works. don't think at all. They could be listening to this in 2025 after yeah, the Spurs have, have already made that pick. After um, the Spurs, yeah, they've made out, they've won more titles. Yes. Oh, uh, but the, so Bryn Forbes, who was kind of a curious signing, I remember hearing of this and I was in the uh, nation of Japan when I heard about the Bryn, Bryn Forbes signing and thought that seems kind of odd to be adding him to a clearly rebuilding team. But lo and behold, he turns into two second round picks, didn't he? For the, mm-hmm. for the modest investment of $4 million. So, um, and, and those might turn into nothing. That might turn into nothing. But they have, uh, the Spurs have definitely, I think it's fair to say they have more assets now that they can use than they did um, a couple of days ago. So, I think they did well today. Um, I kind of felt out a, we'll call him a league exec type about a week ago, Mm -hmm. just to see what what he thinks the market for Thad Young would be, what the Spurs could get for him. He said they'd be doing well to get a second round pick. Um, Uh And if they're doing really, really good, maybe two second round picks. So for them to turn that into a, a probable first round pick, I think is a, is a, you know, is a good value there. They did have yeah. to trade the Detroit pick to get that. So that's it's true. really, it's really trading up from 33 right. to 18 or 33 to 20. Yeah. But yes. So overall they traded Derek White, Eubanks, Thaddeus Young, Bryn Forbes, five games of Hernan Gomez and Detroit's 22 second round pick for bio candidate, Goran Dragic, Sadoransky, who's, role with the team will be determined, I guess. Josh Richardson, Romeo Langford, Boston's 22 first round pick, one through four protected. Toronto's 2022 first round pick, one through 14 protected. And if it doesn't convey, it's one through 13 next year. Utah's 2027 second round pick and Denver's 2028 second round pick. That's, that's a lot, that's a lot of assets. Uh, uh, Dragic will not play for the Spurs. Well, let's do this. Uh, let's not, let's I'm, talk I'm about. Not, I'm not breaking it. I'm not breaking any news here. Dragic yeah. will not play for the Spurs. He's going to get bought out. Will any of these players uh, contribute for this team? That's what we can talk about. Uh, players well, coming. The, 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 those two will not. Uh, Josh Richardson and Romeo Langford are going to be on the team. Um, I've pretty much. This was obvious because of the contracts, but the the the, the, the Spurs. I can tell you do expect them to be part of the team this year for sure. And they are actually signed to guaranteed deals next year. I'm sure that they um, will be trade possibilities in the off season as everyone's a trade possibility. But um, yes, those other guys like Dragic, um, his, he's on an expiring deal. So that's coming off the books. Uh, those two Boston guys um, are signed for next year. Uh, I don't think they're a huge part of the future. The, the point of that deal was to get the first round pick, but I mean, they, who knows? You, you, you take flyers on guys The Romeo Langford was once a, uh, a college guy that scouts had interest in. He hasn't really made himself a star, but you never know. And he's cheap enough. And, and those, their combined salaries are less than uh, for sure, less than what they owe Derek White over the course of the deal. So that's coming off the books after next year. Josh Richardson was, and maybe he still is an interesting player. Do you play him in this situation? Like, is he a guy that you, you play on a nightly yeah, basis? I think that's a good question for Greg Popovich. Once, once this becomes official and you get a chance to talk to him in Atlanta tomorrow, I don't think you play Josh Richardson 
if it means less of a look at Josh Primo, I don't think you start Josh Richardson instead of like Devin Vassell, who I think like, I don't have this confirmed in, in any way, but I would think that Devin Vassell would get a look as a starter now in that Derek White role. If it's not Lonnie, uh, maybe both of them get shots at it. There's going to be minutes available with guys gone now. And uh, I'm sure Josh Richardson can take some of them. Romeo Langford can take some of them, but I don't think that they, they, they were not the keys to these, to, to the, to these sure. deals that this first made today. What are you thinking if you're a uh, DeJounte Murray right now? Well, he, uh, didn't, didn't he send out a uh, Kevin Hart? Uh, WTF yeah. It said, uh, it's, yeah. yeah that, that means what, uh, where's the fudge? I didn't get it. Yes. Yes. I, didn't I think get that's it. what it meant. I didn't get it. Remember, Previous years of podcasts where we wasted so much time uh, pondering whether DeJounte Murray and Derek White could coexist and how do you play both of them? And, you know, these are the two young guards, the future, and do you need to pick one or the other? Like, they always liked each other. And yeah. uh, uh, they love playing together. And so, again, we forget that there's humans involved here. These are not robots. And DeJounte is going to miss his friend. Jakob Pertl. Jakob Pertl and Derek, uh, you know, great oh, chemistry sure. on and off the court. From what I've heard, like, I don't have friends personally, but I've yeah. heard over the years that when you do have them, that you like being around them. See, my favorite, my favorite quality is a friend and a friend is that he lives very, he or she lives very, very, very far away. Uh-huh. So, but, but yeah, Tom, that's, that's a, a good point. Um, you know, it's not just the backcourt mates, but the Jakob and, uh, and Derek were really tight. Yeah. So that's kind of sad to see that split up. The HEB will have to refilm some commercials. Yeah. That oh, that's right. It's a good thing. They, they, uh, the Spurs got rid of all those bobbleheads like last week. Speaking of that, that's one reason, one way the uh, San Antonio community will miss Derek. He's very active in the community. Those bobbleheads were, as Tom wrote about, were for, Morgan's Wonderland, yes. which he was yeah. involved with. So, you know, he did a lot of charity work. And I think that's, you know, one thing he should be applauded for as he leaves town. And just a really, really nice go-to guy for the beat guys. Always available, yeah. always uh, upbeat. Always Good dad talking. jokes. Good dad Good jokes. Dad jokes. Yeah. Positive side for him. He's going to a team that he's got, you know, the coaching staff. There's familiarity there. I'm sure that played a big role. Ime Yudoka, Will Hardy. Oh, yeah. Interestingly, his dad is from Boston and grew up a, a big Celtics I did not know that. I did not know that. There is some excitement on that end uh, about where he landed. We might be missing some clicks from the, the White family, the always uh, <sighs> uh, loyal readers and whatnot. Like, that's, that's going to be a shame. So, Derek, yeah. Derek White, Derek White game came from good people too. Losing Derek, our uh, our dad joke quotient goes down. Uh, losing Drew Eubanks are just rampant and unnecessary cursing in post game interviews. Uh, yeah, <laughs> <Goes down. laughs> I think we can tell this story. What was it? A couple Tom a couple weeks ago, or <laughs> gratuitous? I think is the word <laughs> gratuitous. Where you yeah. asked drew a question about something and he it, it, oh, was, it, was, a, it was a pass from, De, that, that pass from DeJounte that went yes, his legs yes. and he said you know what are you thinking and Drew's first answer was uh, don't F it up don't fudge it up uh-huh. and uh, like the, our, our, the, the Spurs PR guys had to say we have to start over we don't want Drew to get fined <laughs> and so Tom asked the exact same question as if it was the first time he asked it which I thought was hilarious and then Drew uh-huh. said, uh, yeah, the first thing I thought was, don't mess it up. And I thought, I just agree. <laughs> but Drew was the king of uh, just gratuitous cursing. Which, as, You know uh, what my favorite uh, interview with the Drew Eubanks era was? It goes back a long time. I don't know if you guys remember. Probably not. Uh, talked to him because of uh, a moment he had in a memorable game early, early, early in Drew Eubanks' career. He had a memorable moment in the final game of a future Hall of Famer at the AT&T Center where he tried to block the final shot of one Dirk Nowitzki. Ah, there you go. Against the protests of even Greg Popovich. Uh, That was Dirk Dirk playing his last game of his career. um, Had a chance to hit one more shot from the elbow. 
and the Spurs had their backups in there because it was not a close game. It was not a competitive game, but Dirk, Dirk wanted to get his last moment. Pop, Pop is telling the players, you know, you're not really supposed to play defense against Dirk in this moment. And then Drew went up just by instinct trying to block the thing. It went in, but Drew had mentioned afterwards how he felt so relieved that Dirk made it because if he, if he had caused Dirk to miss it, he never would have, uh, he never would have heard the end of it. <laughs> All right. Well, let's, um, I, here's what I'm curious about. Like we've been talking about how the Spurs are clearly just uh, playing for the future now. They don't care that much about about the, pre- about the present. Like they made all these deals. They really only traded one guy of consequence, though. Like, are they yeah. are they really going to go in the in the tank now and lose a bunch of games, or you know, this is my point. About what they are. This I I alluded to this in. Um something I wrote for the uh, newspaper and for the expressnews.com. What? Where can I find uh, this column and information? Uh, you can go to expressnews.com, subscribe to the Spurs Nation newsletter, all that type of stuff. Well, that's like, wrote. In a, in a way, uh, they can jam an awful lot of tanking into a brief period here if they do this right. Um, instead of subjecting fans to years and years of misery, which tanking is miserable. I mean, the, the people, the, the fans who have had to watch the Spurs who were just kind of a moderate disappointment this year, they really haven't been that bad, are like yeah. losing their minds because of some of the games they've lost. Imagine watching this to a worse degree for like six years, like the Sixers did, or a decade like the Kings did. It's, it can be miserable. Well, if they if the Spurs just are are kind of, terrible for the next two months like the perfect number for them would be to win exactly six games the rest of the year so pop can have his dumb record which shouldn't be a record anyway <laughs> and uh and then, they end, and then they end up with the work with with their best odds at one of these top picks and the, 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 there's three really attractive uh picks the top of this draft um that that the scouts say could be I mean, they're not guaranteed superstars, but they they have potential to be that. If you can if you can work your way into a into a top three pick, and then c- combine that with the two other first round picks that you got from Boston and Toronto, and then add that to the improving uh, core of you know Kelvin Johnson and Devin Vassell and Josh Primo, and then your All Star Dejounte Murray, who producer Luis has reminded us was just drafted in the all-star draft while we're recording this by Kevin Durant, who passed on James Harden, by the way, seven times tonight. Oh my uh, goodness. James, James Harden was the last player picked in the, oh in my the goodness. all-star draft. And then he's, and then he's going to try to get awesome. traded to the other team. Yeah, exactly. Anyway, the, my, my point is like, it's like you remember the Warriors did this a couple of years ago. They had one really bad year, got James Wiseman out of it. And now they're good again. Like the, Spurs probably can't do that, but yeah, they don't if, have if, you, if things if they get lucky over the next couple of uh, months, like with the lottery, and then um, I mean they might not be forcing their fans into a, a long extended tanking rebuild type of thing. So this is I a more mean, hopeful. Uh, sounding they still might mess around. And they still might mess around and get in a play-in game. They could. I, I, I'm not I, saying they're gunning for that, but they just might fall into it. It's not that, that hard to be uh, 10th. I think that might be a reach at this point still. Just I mean, the thing is, like the Kings, an effort today. The I mean, Kings and the Pelicans are really trying for it. Yeah, and that might not mean they're going to be good at it because when they try it for things, they aren't necessarily successful, those two franchises. But they, <laughs> they are the two who are really trying to get into 10th. Portland is still not t- terrible. <laughs> um, no, they're terrible. <laughs> I mean, yeah. And in the meantime, um, this this rebuilding team in this miserable season, uh, so to speak, has an all star to brag about, which I think is news since we last recorded a podcast. Um, you're speaking about Dejounte Murray, correct? Yeah, let's talk about that. Yeah, it's it's a nice. It was nice. It was nice. It's nice he's on the team. Um, you know, obviously he did he did make the initial team, which we kind of anticipated. But we also know there was going to be injuries, and there was uh, an injury to one Draymond Green. And, uh, you know, DeJounte gets to replace him on orders of NBA commissioner Adam Silver. And it's just a nice honor for him and for the franchise. 
um, which had been a, you know, a mainstay in the all-star game for like four decades um, until this recent uh, two season drought. Um, DeJounte breaks that. And it was a nice honor to him. I really sort of enjoyed, they did a, um, like a media zoom with him the night after he would the day or a night after he was uh, named to the team. And I really enjoyed, um, I really enjoyed that zoom. He was very open and honest and um, was. obviously very excited. Excited, families. His family's excited. When you talk about, um, you know, he'll, he's talked about this a lot, where he's come from, and just the fact that he is um, an NBA player at all um, is is a lot for him and his family to process. And now that he's an NBA All Star, obviously there was um, it was an emotional emotional honor and emotional press uh, presser for him, and it was it was you know it was good stuff. That was it was a good feel good story for this team in a season that. Hasn't had a whole lot of that. A couple of uh, highlights from that that I enjoyed. Uh, one of them, his four-year-old daughter freaking out because everyone in the house was crying and she thought something bad had happened. It turned out it was uh, it was tears of joy that Dejounte Murray had become an all-star. Another thing, um, he was asked if he knew how many other players from the 2016 draft class, uh, the draft class in which he was selected 29th, and famously had to wait for a long time to hear his name called when he was asked if he knew how many other, how many members from that draft class would be at the all-star game this month. He answered just DeJounte, which is true. Um, and sort of another testament to uh, the, the job that the Spurs have done of finding those type of players at the, at the bottom of drafts. So yeah, good, good moment for him. The part I found interesting um, was him talking with someone asked him, you know, you've got to this all-star level, like what else do you have to, to improve? He's big on room for improvement and always trying to get better and work on what, what do you have to improve? And he said basically everything. And I thought what he said was interesting. Like he didn't grow up like a lot of people, a lot of kids these days with, uh, you know, an organized way to play basketball. People, you know, at a young age, teaching them the game, um, clubs and, and, uh, 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 and that sort of thing. He, he didn't have, he's, you know, he said, he flat said, I didn't have a mom and dad that would take me, to the park and shoot hoops. I mean, I, everything I learned at, you know, before the age of 16, 17, he had to learn on his own, on the fly, just from watching the game, imitating what he saw. And so he kind of feels like he's behind a lot of these more like groomed um, prospects that have come into the NBA that have just been at the, you know, the best prep school since, since they were um, young teenagers and, you know, groomed to be NBA players. And so he feels like he's, I think his quote was along the lines of like, he still feels like he's got some catching up to do. So I think that was just interesting to me, the way he views it, the way he thinks about it and the, and the way to think about it, that he kind of, um, you know, pulled himself up by his bootstraps, so to speak, to become an NBA all-star. I thought that was a really interesting and, and I dare say heartwarming thing to think about. I'm not sure if we've lost Tom Orsborn on this, uh, on this podcast yet, but one thing that we've laughed about so we got to replace it with Pete Best, <laughs> right? One thing we've laughed about over the over the years of covering Dejounte is is what's a common answer for Dejounte when you ask him about anything that's happening in the world of the basketball in the league? He always meant, "Well, I wa- what does he say? I watch a lot of basketball. He loves basketball, watches a lot of it. And I tell you what, if there's a middle school guy out there that's that's uh, doing something right now, Dejounte knows about him." You cannot mention a basketball player on no. earth that he will he, that he will say he's never seen. Oh, he's yeah. oh, you, you, some random you know ten day yeah. contract guy that the uh, that the Timberwolves <laughs> signed during the pandemic. Oh, I watch a lot of basketball, and I I was watching him when, when he was at you know the New England State in two thousand nineteen. <laughs> I, I watched them on I watched them on the on the package on the internet package. It's it's amazing. It's on the up and up, and like I said, if there's someone. Shining in in middle school hoops in our area, I bet you Dejounte knows about him. Yeah, well, like like Je- that goes to what Jeff was saying about how he's kind of had to uh, mold himself and 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 just immerse himself in this in this thing, yeah. and that it's good to see it pay off. Yeah, it, it it really is, and as he stressed, you know, his family his family's been through a lot, and it, as he said, it's good to see good things happening to good to good people. So, um, yeah, it was, it was a good, good moment for him, the franchise and, and the fans. 
And then here comes the trade deadline and it's what the fudge. Yeah. <laughs> Where's the fudge? Sorry. Where's the fudge? I think that, uh, you know, that he, he'll miss Derek, but he has found the bright side before he has made uh, the proverbial lemonade out of the lemons over the years. He will do it again. Like our listeners will like our readers of expressnews.com will like we all will until the next time we see you on the Spurs Insider podcast while we take care of each other and keep it real. <laughs>